Good morning. You're with the Vermont House Government Operations Committee. Uh, we are meeting here this morning to take a look at uh, just focused on the duties of the task force uh, that will convene this summer. Um, and uh, we did a little bit of work with Chris Roop from the Joint Fiscal Office yesterday to, uh, to help wrap our brains around um, a potential um, goal or focus target of what the task force should be looking to solve to. Um, and so I wanted us to just have a chance to focus um, solely on, uh, on what those duties look like right now. Um, our legislative council drafter couldn't be here today. And so um, we've got Chris Roop here to help clarify any, um, you know, what does this mean in, in, in layman's terms? Um, and then between Chris and, and uh, the vice chair and myself, we'll convey any changes that uh, the committee thinks we ought to make to ledge council so that she can redraft it over the weekend and we can take another look at the duties of the task force when we are back in committee on Tuesday. So has everybody had a chance to jump on the documents for today? All right, so if you could, um, I think what we want is the powers and duties, the second document that is up on our committee page under Rebecca Wasserman's name and today's date. And you'll see that this extracts just the powers and duties. And, um, and so John, why don't you, Lee, John Gannon, lead the discussion of, um, of what's in here. And, um, and that way I can keep my eyes on calling on hands if people want to ask questions. Um, and we can review this. Now, my hope is that if you have suggestions of things that you want the task force to be focused on that you don't see here, or if you, or if you think that there's something that could be made a little clearer, we'll have a discussion about that right now, and then we can uh, have that drafted for us to look at next week. Sound like a plan? Bob Hooper. Jumping right in, Madam Chair, thank you. Um, <clears throat> the, I had a conversation last night and I guess this morning with Chris trying to ferret out what John's intention yesterday was with this stabilization target number. It came across to me as we were setting a floor. And when I looked at the language of the current 2038 plan, there are escalators built into that. And I'm kind of wondering, John, Representative Gannon, what your thought is on how concrete the floor is. Um, maybe Chris Roop can jump in a little here too. And, and discuss that but you know I, I do think that that holding uh, accrued liability um, increases down is important so I mean I, I think that was the concept here well I, and I agree with that I did the the issue is if what I heard you say yesterday was we set a number and if that number is static then as the expected funding for the 2038 unfunded liability number grows, then there has to be a, something made up someplace. And if we stick cost sharing into that too, then all of a sudden we're increasing the overall liability to the participants pretty significantly. So I wanna make sure we're sort of on the same page when we're talking about something high, hypothetical and how they interact with each other. And if this is too far afield, since everybody has a glassy eyed look, uh, that's fine. Well, I, mean, I was in part of the conversation with Chris. So maybe Chris can explain what you talked about and how it applies to the language we have in front of us. Sure. Uh, uh, Chris Ripp, uh, Joint Fiscal Office. Uh, just, just to sort of clarify, I, you know, I, I, think, I think what Representative Hooper's asking is, uh, it, is you know the the intent around the pension stabilization target number and you know pl please jump in if I'm, I'm mischaracterizing this but my 
the way I interpreted uh, the intent here was to try to tie that target number to the dollar increase that we saw from FY21 to FY22. So um, I, I think what, what Representative Hooper is referring to with sort of the floor is um, a reference to how these payments are calculated. So every year when they do the valuation studies, they'll take a look at, you know, what is, what is the current unfunded liability? You know, what, what's your accrued liabilities? What's the assets in the plan? And how many years do you have left to pay it off? So they'll recalculate that unfunded liability total and calculate what those annual payments will be from now until 2038 on a basis where those, pay, those uh, amortization payments increase by 3% a year. And that's set in statute right now. So uh, when he's referring to the floor, he's referring to, you know, what is sort of your starting place on your, your unfunded liability and your ADAC? Um, and I think that's, that's the number that I think the intent was to try to, try to reduce that amount commensurate with the, the amount of increase we saw from year to year most recently. Having said that, that doesn't guarantee that, you know, future payments, future payments will still increase under a status quo situation, but the amortization payments would increase in 3% increments until reaching fully funded in 2038. But I think the intent is, is to just lower the, the floor at which those 3% increases kick in by some level commensurate with those year-to-year -year increases. And I think the, the language here, which, which uh, Becky drafted that, that you know, the, the committee can review this morning, uh, I think the intent here was to set forth direction to the committee to put forth recommendations or a series of recommendations that could you know, either reduce the accrued liabilities by that dollar amount commensurate with the increase and set forth some recommendations that would reduce the ADAC payment commensurate with that year-to-year -year increase. And then it would be up to the legislature to uh, take a look at that menu of options and, and, and decide on what they want to move forward with. I hope that added clarity and not more confusion. And since John is nodding his head a lot, I assume you agree. I wanted to make sure you weren't setting a firm number now that would not be adjusted in the future. That's correct. I mean, thank you. Rep McCarthy. Yeah, I, I wanted to just try and make sure I'm wrapping my head around the proposal that's on the table. So my understanding of this language is we're telling the task force what we're looking for recommendations on is how to reduce the ADEC payments but from the 22 amount to the 21 amount that we're not telling you reduce them generally. We're not saying go after the entire unfunded liability in one year or something that's unrealistic and crazy. We're just saying there was this big jump in the last year with money and policy recommendations. How do we get back on the amortization plan that we were on before? Am I understanding that right? Yeah, and, and if I may, uh, just to put a slightly finer point on that, uh, I, I believe the intent here is not to freeze everything, you know, again, not freeze anything at last year's levels, but it's, it's peg the recommendations to the size of the increase we saw from year to year, the size of the dollar increase from year to year. Anyone else on that? All right, Rep Gannon, why don't you uh, just sort of guide us through uh, the, the various powers and duties here. And I think folks will uh, recognize that there's been some condensing of the focus. Um, so we should consider these one by one and understand what, uh, what the task force is gonna be asked to evaluate. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so this is the power, power and duty section uh, of the, the draft committee bill. Um, as you can see, it's been reorganized. Um, and the, the first um, power and duty we've been just discussing, um, which is setting a pension stabilization target um, for the teachers and state employees pension. Um, and Chris has explained um, the intent with respect to that language, which is on the first page. Um, and so I won't go into that in detail because we just had a discussion about it. Um, then what happens on the second page is we just refined the, the powers and duties a bit um, to, to simplify them to some extent. Um, 
And so the next duty is a five-year review of benefit expenditure levels, as well as an employer and employee contribution levels and growth rates, and a three and five-year, 10-year production of those levels and rates. Um, and then three um, has the, the task force looking based on benefit and funding benchmarks, um, propose new benefit structures um, with the objective of adequate benefits within the established cost containment benchmarks, which goes back to number one in the powers and duties, including an evaluation of shared risk models for employee contributions and cost of living adjustments. Um, and then B, an estimate of the cost of current and any proposed benefit structures on a budgetary pay-as-you-go and full actuarial basis. Um, then four, funding methods. So that's looking at how we're going to fund this. Um, so including contributions from the state and employees to achieve benefit and funding benchmarks. So we're looking at the funding, um, including revenue, um, to, to see how we can fund this. And then a plan, finally, a plan for pre-funding pre, pre OPEP um, with an evaluation of using federal funds to the extent possible. Um, so that, that's just a refinement of what was in the original draft. Um, but I think, you know, simplifies it because I think one of the things we want to do is to get this task force off the ground quickly and get them focused it is make their mandate um, as simple as possible for them to understand. Thank you. Rep Higley. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'd like to maybe go back up. I believe it would be 3A, um, somewhere in there, uh, when it uh, talks about proposed new benefit structures. Uh, I think if we don't include the provision around looking at a hybrid plan that would include a DC plan um, that that might get overlooked. overlooked. And to me, um, I think there's so many benefits uh, uh, to looking at that, whether it's um, you know, the vested issue, whether it's uh, an investment issue around, you know, I know uh, a few years back, I was involved with uh, the group wanting to pull out of fossil fuels and uh, you know, something, something like that, there wouldn't be an issue. You'd, you'd invest where you want to invest. Um, anyway, there's, there's enough issues there and enough uh, opportunity there to look at that I'd, I'd like to see that wording uh, in there somewhere. Yep. Excellent. We will make note of that and um, try to get a, a revision of that to put in front of the committee next week. Uh, Rep. Cooper. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> I fully apologize, but I still object to the idea of including OPEB conversation in this. It is not unfunded liability. It is an obligation of the state that's true, but uh, it muddies the water a lot. It's a very valid conversation. Uh, to me, it's like buying five new dump trucks for AOT. It's an obligation of the state, but shouldn't be in this conversation. I know I I'm, can appreciate my... that. However, I would note that it is seems to be a shared consensus between the treasurer, the administration, and legislative leadership that all those buckets need to be on the table, and so that's why it's here. And I recognize that, and it clearly does not bar me from raising the issue. <laughs> Thank let's, you. Let's take a straw poll on that because I think it would be most efficient if we tried to reduce the number of times that we retread um, issues that we have already brought up. So I'd like to ask the committee for a yes or no. Do you agree that all four buckets need to be on the table as we consider solving the state's liability uh, with respect to retiree pensions and health benefits. So um, I know that Sam is not on uh, video right now, but maybe Sam, you can unmute and just say yes or no. Um, if you agree that we should have all four buckets um, expressed in the powers and duties, um, please give me a thumbs up or a verbal yes. One, two, three, four. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, 
seven, eight, and Sam makes nine. Okay, if you disagree, please give me a verbal or a thumbs up. And if you are still mulling the topic and don't have an opinion right now. Okay. <laughs> Let the record reflect that we have a 911. And Rep. LeClaire has his hand patiently waiting to speak. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, a couple, one comment, I guess, and a couple questions in that I would think that those that are the beneficiary of these OPEB payments would probably feel quite differently that they would like to know what to plan on going forward, I would think. Um, I do have a question on section, uh, I guess it's on the top of page two, the, the three and five year um, look back. I'm, I want to understand one of the, one of my concerns is, is that um, we haven't had the look back on plan expenses and income, obviously as frequently as we should. And is the intent that we're only gonna look back every three and five years? And is there an opportunity there to do a bit of a slight course correction if need be in the interim? Does that make sense? I know. Um, I can attempt to answer that. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, so, you know, one of the things that we were doing in the other section of this bill with respect to, to VPIC is going from a five to a three year experience study. So that, yeah. that is in the other section of the bill. Um, what the task force is doing is doing is just doing a review uh, of benefit, benefit expenditures and looking at um, at you know employee contribution levels and growth rates, um, you know projecting them out for the next three, five, and ten years. So they have some idea uh, of what is anticipated to happen, um, so that they can then decide how they want to address um, the contribution. What I anticipate will be contribution increases. Um, so I think that's what is it being attempted here. Is okay. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, it does. Thanks, John. I have to say, overall, I, I support the concept. I understand that there's a little bit to be concerned about. There's a lot to feel that it's going to help address the issue. Um, the only other concern that I have is, and I've expressed this in the past, is that I, I don't want this to take, I, I don't want this to be a summer study committee. I would much prefer that we get a group working on this, at least constituting this group as quickly as possible so that we can start working on this issue um, and come to some sort of agreement and resolution as quickly as possible. Um, I had hoped that we could do something by the end of this fiscal year. If we could do something to expedite it before the July 15th date, I would certainly support a lot more, support this if we could do something along the lines of maybe on passage or something along that lines, that would give me some comfort in going forward. How Thank are you. folks feeling about uh, getting this task force established ASAP? Yes, yes, okay. All right, we'll note that for a revision. Thank you, Sam. <coughs> Rep Lefebvre, excuse me. Um, Rep. Anthony. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I, as I think most of you know, I've been uh, myself trying to figure out how to narrow the issues uh, while not being um, exclusionary uh, about those things which, A, there's still some difference of opinion, or B, um, uh, could potentially uh, be contributory to success. I want to go back to the four buckets I don't want to get an argument of whether it's three or four buckets. Uh, frankly, I don't think anybody who has spoken to this issue disagrees with prefunding. And so I, I guess I would just say, why don't we tell the task force, unless you feel very strongly, that bucket is already uh, decided, so to say, so that we don't you know, have them waste time 
unless there's some secret or some mysterious uh, majority out there, I've never heard anybody say we should. So I just want to av avoid wasting time on that bucket. Uh, I guess it's my suggestion. Uh, whether they're equivalent to pensions or not, I don't want to get into that argument. I just want to narrow the issues to what we really need to know and what we really need to do uh, is all my, my point. And, and back, I, I deeply appreciate um, um, Mark's, um, uh, Eric's, oh God, uh, uh, Rep Higley's uh, return to the issue. But frankly, I have heard nobody who said we could afford to switch horses. And so again, I, you know, leaving the task force with the idea that we might even entertain that um, as a hybrid system, or I, I just think invites discussion that I don't see going anywhere. I mean, I, the, the sheer fiscal uh, burden of trying to have a parallel system while we're unwinding the uh, defined benefit is like nobody has told us, including Scott Beck, when uh, Representative Beck, when he talked about that, what the glide path would look like. And I, I just think, you know, again, I'm trying to make the work useful and tidy for this task force. That's all I'm uh, uh, attempting to do to accomplish. Thank you. All right, so I think I saw a hand go up in response to the question. So uh, Rep Higley, did you wanna talk about DC hybrid DB? Yeah, if, if I could. Again, yeah. we may not have heard about that, but that's not for the lack of trying. Okay, the Reason Foundation, month and a half ago, I, I talked to Sam and uh, Samantha and I had, had talked with them. They're more than willing to come and talk with us. They are working with other states. It is happening. I believe that the Vermont Business Roundtable has also talked about it. Uh, so it's, it's not something that hasn't been talked about. And it's definitely not something that isn't isn't workable. I mean, uh, it's uh, yeah, yeah. I I have heard uh, hybrid option being um, being talked about, and um, and I, in truth, I have heard um, from individuals within both employee groups that uh, that they would appreciate that option. Uh, anyone else on this topic before I go back to the regular hands? And Rep. Lefebvre says options. Uh, Rep. Leclerc. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I have to agree uh, with the member from Lowell in that um, I, like you, Madam Chair, have spoken with several people, as we all have over time, about these about this issue, and I have had the comment made to me that these there's a lot of people that would like this as an option for a variety of reasons, one being, um, I think the member from Burlington had mentioned things about divesting from South African stocks to fossil fuels, where if you have a defined contribution plan, you can have much more input into those sort of things yourself if you want, for one. Two, defined contribution plans are not a novel idea here. We've got several examples where that's already an option within the state retirement plan already. The executive branch, I think, uh, was it Beamers? Is that correct? Um, have that as an option. And there is a third one here and it is escaping me here, but so this is not a, a unique concept. So I would totally support this group having this conversation. And the last point that I will make is that those that I have spoken with about this um, with the current plan have expressed a little frustration in that we do seem to have these rather significant conversations about once every 10 years around these defined benefit plans. And there is a, a little lack of confidence around the process and sometimes those that are making the decisions. So I think that there is a feeling that people would like to have more direct input into their retirement plan. So I totally support that this should be a part of the conversation. We will take a look at some new language on that. Uh, Rep Gannon, did you jump in because you wanted to answer something particular to this? Otherwise, I'll go back to the previous list of hands. Need you to unmute. 
I apologize. Um, two things re re with respect to Representative Anthony's comment um, about prefunding OPEB, that is in subsection five, a plan for prefunding um, OPEB with an evaluation of using federal funds to the extent permissible. So that is, um, is, is clearly set out um, under these duties. Um, but obviously if people want it more precisely set forth, we can do that. Um, and the other thing I would just raise with respect to, to um, Representative Higley's and LeClaire's um, statements about uh, DC plans, I, I note that the, the chair and I received an email um, from a the, one of the members from Essex um, today um, a, from a teacher indicating that they were interested in a DC plan um, and weren't sure that the, the union would raise that issue. Um, so I, I just note that we have heard um, from at least one teacher who, who would like something like that on the table. Excellent. Uh, Rep Hooper. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, to that last comment, uh, both the state employees and the teachers have DC plans as an option for which they were originally designed available to them. Um, and I agree with Representative Anthony, the esteemed junior member from Barry, that it's, it's not necessarily a question at this point of whether or not it's a good thing or a bad thing. It's a question that we're in the middle of trying to figure out how to fund this and that's gonna cost more. So that seems to be the bottom line. However, the other uh, senior member from Barry raised an issue that causes me to, if we are indeed talking about cost sharing here, to do so without, to do so while continuing to look at the state plan as one plan, homogenous, as opposed to uh, the unfunded liability that is accrued to each individual plan within the state plan is patently unfair because quite frankly, as I've said many times, and as I have requested at least six times, uh, the different cost and attributed unfunded liability uh, accrual is different for each one of these plans. So if somebody retires and buys a Mercedes and somebody else retires and starts to wonder whether they can eat at uh, a, a restaurant more than once a week to continue to cost share in that way seems inequitable. And uh, I would again ask that we put something in here that says the plans need to be looked at individually because they are not homogenous. Their liability is different and their cost share, if we go that way, should be different. Thank you. The groups need to be looked at in more individually, yes. They are yes. designated in statute, I think, as plans, so. Okay, well, I would love to um, suggest that revision because I think that's something that has come up a number of times. Um, so we will uh, try to make that uh, a more explicit duty of the task force. Uh, Rep Vyhovsky. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of things. Um, one of them is that I see the um, line about um, stakeholder input has been removed. And I think it's really important that we have that put in that, that I think it was subsection 8D, the portion that says during the course of deliberations and prior to any final recommendations being made, the task force will solicit input, including through public hearings from affected stakeholders. I think that's really important to keep it in here. Um, I also wanted to share some concerns about starting the task force before July 1, given the teachers and the school year, and I think asking them to play catch up for a task force that started while they're still navigating a COVID school year really isn't okay or fair. Um, so I, I have some real concerns with that. Um, I also, and then there's two pieces that I would like to see. Um, one put back in and one considered to be added. One is around specifically a permanent revenue source. Um, that's something I think we've talked a lot about and I do think is really important for the task force to look at. I also think that while we're talking about drastically restructuring, putting the idea of divestment from fossil fuels back on the table as, as a possibility is important. Okay, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, Rep Gannon, I saw you shaking your head about the 
reference to uh, stakeholder involvement in, um, it, we're looking at sort of a, a subsection of the original bill just related to the powers and duties. Um, so Rep Gannon, did you find um, reference to the stakeholder engagement in a different part of the bill? No, that's correct, Madam Chair. That section hasn't been taken out. Um, okay. I apologize if that's confusing in, in this limited section that we're looking at, but I just wanna confirm that there is no intent to take that section out. In fact, I, I think we're thinking about identifying some of the stakeholders um, that should definitely be um, part of this discussion. Yeah. And, and if anybody has any thoughts uh, about who should be part of this discussion, who, which stakeholders definitely need to, to be in front of this task force, um, please, please let the chair or, or myself know. Yes, because we're going to convey um, this discussion to Ledge Council with the hope that um, she can incorporate some of these suggestions into uh, a, a revised draft on Tuesday. Um, so if there are suggestions of uh, specific stakeholders you'd like engagement with, um, I think that makes sense. Uh, the next point Rep. Gehoski just made was around uh, the start date for the task force and not wanting uh, our education professionals to feel like they are unable to follow the work of the task force. Um, I know that the school year started late because of the pandemic. I don't know for sure whether the end date is going to extend past mid-June. Does anybody know what the school calendars are looking like around the state? We didn't start till after Labor Day. If you give me a second, because I work in a school, I can go check my school calendar and see when they're put, um, put, pinning the end date. Just give me a minute. Okay, let's, uh, let's have that conversation. I know there's some variability around the state based on how many snow days different districts may have had or how many, um, uh, you know, shutdowns due to COVID outbreaks might have occurred during the year. Um, typically, it would be pretty clear by mid-June that, uh, that schools are out of session. So um, let's just confirm that and, and see. Um, so your next point was dedicated revenue source. And I think, um, I think that we did have new revenue um, more clearly outlined in a previous draft. So I think we can probably um, we can probably make that clearer here that the task force should uh, consider new revenue because that that was one of our directives. Uh, then the last one, the issue of divestment. Um, I'm hoping we can like time out on that because that does feel like a whole different conversation that we might want to have. Um, and uh, so June 15th is currently listed as the last day of school. Is that, um, does that seem like an adequate start date to folks? No. All right, we have a difference of opinion there. So let's flag that and um, maybe we can have Ledge Council uh, just uh, flag that for us and we will make a final decision on that when we, uh, when we get to the final draft of the bill next week. Um, Rep Lefebvre. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Um, thank you. So I was just wanted to um, come back to the remarks from Representative LeClaire and Representative Higley um, and that I just wanted to share my appreciation for um, this being able to have a closer look um, because that was my whole goal was just for there to be options for the participants and the plans. Um, Cause as I had said, that was the biggest cry. One of the biggest cries that I heard is that people were forced to do something. And if they had options, maybe they wouldn't have done that. And to me, uh, people should be able to be their own stewards um, and stakeholders. So I wanted to share my appreciation for that being um, up for discussion during the task force. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Rep Hooper. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I 
have just had a flight of ideas thing. And I think that it's really significant and we should at least have some level of discussion on it. But um, in the context of the last proposal, we were talking about a significant extension of the amount of years somebody would have to work. And the response was, I'm going to quit early. The largest driver of bankruptcy in the country now is healthcare. And the unintended consequence of people walking out the door early since provision of health care to retirees, at least in the state pool, I'm not sure about the teachers, is meeting that retirement date. Um, and it seems to me like that could very well throw a lot of people into the abyss of no health care, possibly, and that's kind of a big thing. So either I don't know how we deal with that, but if the commission recommends uh, something that causes people to work longer and they don't want to, that's the unintended consequence. And that comes back to haunt us in state benefit provision. So maybe we make money, maybe we lose money. It, to me, it seems like a big thing that we might've missed. I'm not sure that I'm hearing a specific recommendation uh, for with respect to the duties of this task force. Uh, I mean, if, if we're if you're suggesting that we need to ask the task force to prepare for the contingency that someone might decide they want to retire early, um, I feel like that's a lot of moving parts for for the task force to. Uh... <laughs> well, I think that. I, I mean, like I said, it's it's a three minutes ago flight of ideas thing that just sort of came together. But I think we should at least say to them, if you're going to do something that possibly impacts the longevity of people in their employment, this has to be something you also take into consideration. That's all I have to offer. Does anyone want to respond with a thought to that? Uh, Rep. Anthony. Uh, <clears throat> one might consider some language uh, that um, encourages uh, the committee to consider um, incentives to uh, stay on till the, uh, in quotes, normal, new normal uh, years of service, whether that goes the road of the rule of 90 or it goes the rule of the road of uh, some minimum years is up to them, uh, but but it occurs to me um, that Rep. Hooper is not wrong about the either disincentives for leaving or incentives for staying. I don't care, you know, really how you frame it, but to, to flag that as a as a worry for the administration as well as for the pension fund as well as for um, OPEB, uh, it's not wrong. Uh, I don't know. I don't want to be too prescriptive about that, but I think the issue itself. Of, of the a balance between the number of people working and the number of people retired is something that has to be kept uh, un, under, under consideration uh, and put through that filter, no matter what proposal is on the table, frankly. Thank you. And I guess I would just say from a, from a makeup of the task force uh, mindset, that's why the director of retirement was envisioned to be on the task force. And that's why the director of human resources from the administration was, uh, was envisioned uh, being able to participate here so that we have that perspective front and center. And if I may, uh, since you asked about the, the several ideas that also previously came up from our representative from Essex, I, I frankly think once you charge uh, a um, group to exercise uh, scrupulously um, careful fiduciary duty, I am not sure uh, telling them about uh, divestment is, is gonna be useful, at least at this point. Um, and so I guess I'm not signing on to that particular um, revision. Uh, Stakeholders are in, so I guess that takes care of itself. 
but it occurred to me going down a prescriptive road uh, was was technically uh, telling them <laughs> um, something that they have to decide and they have to feel out for themselves. Thanks. It would occur to me that it would be beneficial to get the perspective of each of the system boards in considering the question of divestment as well, because it, you know, when push comes to shove, this is their money. Uh, who's next on my list? Rep Leclerc, you're next. Thank you, Madam Chair. A um, couple of things here. Um, well, I guess to circle back, start with the divestment, I feel very strongly that that is not a conversation that you have on the pension side of things, um, on the investment side. If you want to have that conversation on the benefit side, I think that that's fair. But at least for me, is that if you feel strongly about that, then you make sure that you're prepared to cover the decrease in plan earnings and plan value. I'm not sure that I'd want to share that with the taxpayers of Vermont. Um, I get some people feel so. I'm, I'm not sure that if you have individual issues that that's the place to have them. Um, so a couple of things that were brought up. One is my understanding is there's nothing that excludes anybody being from being a part of this commission. Is it? I think it's pretty broad and fairly comprehensive as far as those that want to be on it and have the input for one. Um, two, as far as the timing goes, um, I feel very strongly we need to do this sooner than later because until I'm shown different facts, the pension that's in the most trouble financially is the teachers and it's to the tune of $13 million a month. Both of these groups are covered by very well represented and highly trained bargaining units that will be at the table representing them. And as somebody who has negotiated with one of those groups, you can certainly do this. It happens throughout the school year. So there's no reason why that can't happen. And of course, you know, we're in April before this thing even gets stood up, we could be well into June anyway. So from a timing perspective, I don't see that being an issue. As far as a funding source goes, we've got one. It's called the state of Vermont and the plan participants. Um, we had a good robust floor debate about a, an additional revenue source that even that if it passed would nowhere near be enough money. So I think that we've already got the funding sources and we just got to focus on those and make sure that they're doing what the plans need them to do. Thank you, Madam Chair. Rep Mariki. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I can appreciate that we do want to move as fast as we can to get started on this. And uh, what I'm going to do is I have two different districts that I represent, two educational districts, and they each have union reps. And I think getting input from them closer to the ground level uh, is something we all could do. And it might not be a, um, an accurate survey. With, with enough, but it might be helpful for us just to check in before we make uh, an assumption that uh, teachers want to go one way or the other. Thank you. Rep Gannon. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to address um, the divestment question. I, I think perhaps this afternoon um, when the treasurer comes in, um, uh, Representative Vihoski could ask about that to her because I think she has done extensive work on that issue in the past and can address her concerns. And I don't want to put words in her mouth, but I think she has had concerns with that. So I think that might be a topic for discussion this afternoon. Yeah. Uh, let's see, Rep Vihoski. Thank you. So I would, I have to respectfully disagree that we have a dedicated funding stream. Part of the reason we're in this mess is that for nearly two decades, the state did not meet its requirement for funding the teacher system. And I think one way that we ensure that we move to that is by dedicating a longstanding funding stream that will always fund this system. So I think it is really important that it's on the table and shows our state employees and our teachers that we actually are committed to doing this differently. Rep McCarthy. 
Yeah, I wanted to initially address some of the comments and, and questions about the, the timeline around, especially the start of the task force work. And it occurs to me that while we're empowering and, re and asking this task force to work on these specific issues, and the reason we're having this conversation is that we recognize the urgency of making sure that we put the pensions on a more sustainable path, that whether it starts on June 15th or July 1st or May 1st, that whatever recommendations are made, we're not gonna be able to act upon them until the legislature comes back. And that the whole reason that we're doing this task force and then having them make recommendations is so that we have the ability to get buy-in, consideration, bring stakeholders together. Like we heard overwhelmingly that we were moving too fast. And the reason we were having these conversations in our committee over the last couple of months is we recognize that urgency that represent, Representative LeClaire talked about, you know, the, the unsustainable path that we're on right now. But um, I don't know that we'll be able to, to act on the, the task force recommendations any faster by having them start a couple of weeks earlier. I also tend to agree with some of what Representative Yehovsky said around, you know, making sure that uh, the employees, that folks get educated, that there's, you know, the misinformation that we heard over the last few weeks can, is kind of put to bed in the, in the public and with members, uh, participant members, and that people feel some buy-in to whatever, um, process, to, you know, to the process and the recommendations that come out of the task force. I also just wanted to say, um, yeah, I guess I'll, I'll leave it there. I, I, I want to make sure that we, we balance the urgency of tackling some of these issues with making sure that we aren't um, making folks who are depending on the system for their retirement feel like there's an imminent collapse. So the urgency is that the costs are ballooning in an unsustainable way, right? Not that we're not going to be able to pay for the benefits that are coming right away. And I think some of the language that we've used in this conversation gets, it, it could muddy the waters for folks out there in the public. And I just wanna make sure we're careful about that. Excellent point, thank you. All right, um, anyone else have a question, comment, thought, or suggestion with respect to the powers and duties that we want to have revised for a draft for Tuesday. Rep Higley. Thank you, Madam Chair. And this may go to Representative Gannon. Um, I was trying to look back uh, at the original draft and talking about the stakeholders piece. Um, and I can't find what I'm looking for. But um, is there any provision in there as to how these stakeholders will get their information to this task force? Uh, in other words, uh, uh, is there going to be a specific uh, uh, email uh, for that task force? Uh, and, and I guess uh, I'm just concerned as far as uh, making sure that these folks are able to and, and what that process looks like. Um, sure, I, I can help answer that, um, Representative Higley. Um, I'll just read you the language um, that we have um, from the original draft, which is stakeholder input. During the course of its deliberations and prior to any final recommendation being made, the task force should solicit input, include, including through public hearings from the affected stakeholders. Okay, so that, all right. Yep, so any, by any means, basically including public hearings. Okay, thanks. All right, any other questions, comments, concerns, suggestions with respect to the powers and duties of the task force? All right, we will do our best to convey these to uh, Ledge Council so that we can have them um, drafted and put in front of the committee. Um, it is my hope that after we meet this afternoon, um, we will have a, a better sense of how to narrow in on uh, on what's closer to a final draft. Um, and so, as I've said many times, you know, if you have needs, if you have thoughts, if you have 
ideas, you know, do catch me and and we can talk through how you might put those ideas on the table. Um, and if there are no other topics that we need to discuss right now, anybody else got anything they want put on the table right now? Nobody's diving in for their little hand. Excellent. Uh, except for Rep. LeClaire, who's coming over to unmute. Yes, well, sir. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to verify that the posted agenda is what you want us to go by as far as when to come back, be back. Oh, yeah, let's review that because um, I think it says one o'clock. Yes, one o'clock, we will have the union representatives and we'll have them for an hour. And then at two o'clock, we will have um, Beth Pierce and Tom Galanka. And I would expect that that will last a full hour. It could spill over into the three o'clock hour and we can certainly have some committee discussion after we have heard from those um, different entities. Um, but yes, in general, you have uh, a lunch break and come back at one. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Thank you, committee, for, um, for the good work on this this morning. And uh, we will do our best to incorporate the, uh, the, the suggestions and, and we can take another look at the language in case we didn't get it right. And, uh, and we'll look at new language on Tuesday. Rep Hooper. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I have a, another commitment at one, which may drag me away for a while. I'll be back as soon as I can. Okay. Well, you will miss out on the teachers and state employees perspective on the bill, but you Don't. can always watch on YouTube. All right, so committee, um, I will see you in a few hours. Thank you.